All right, it's time for episode three of my Q&A. So, if you haven't seen my other two episodes, there's like two whole episodes. It's like really long. So, <laughs> but this, let's just get over the questions for episode three, okay? So, the next questions are from Not So Livid, who is also one of the first people that I ever subscribed to. And also, like, somebody, my channel just wouldn't be the same without them. They are absolutely the sweetest ever. So you should go and subscribe to them because that would totally embarrass him. And that's entirely what he deserves being so a nice person, okay? <laughs> so let's look at question number one. Question number one is, who is your biggest creative inspiration? Okay. Well, my first biggest creative inspiration was Philip Pullman. He's an author and I read his dark materials, his book, his dark materials. I read that when I was at school. And after I read that, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. I just wanted to like do that. And so he's, he's been very inspiring for me and it's one of my favorite books and he's one of my favorite authors. And I just really like him as a person. And then when I went to university, I read Ray Bradbury. And um, my favorite book of all time is Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. And so I feel that Philip Pullman, you know, he got me to go to university to study writing. But once I was there, I read Ray Bradbury. And honestly, in the, the year that I read that, my writing just completely like leveled up like a lot. Like his his writing, he showed me uh, how to do it. And he said, he said, like Ray Bradbury, he's like, oh, I just get up in the morning and he described it as like having a, a a rain barrel that collects overnight and he just goes to the rain barrel in the morning and collects a cup of water and he's like he doesn't need to he doesn't need to try to write he just knows that it's going to be there and he relies on it being there so yeah that really transformed my ability to write it uh, how he did um i suppose that they're much more literary and what i do on youtube is more of an entertainment ish kind of thing and they're more literary so I guess I would pick um Leonard Green uh, for that. Um I really like him. Uh he's a he's a magician. He d- he doesn't refer to himself as a magician. He just refers to himself as good with cards or something like that. But um he you have to you have to see him to appreciate him. His energy is basically everyone's favorite uncle or everyone's favorite grandpa. That's his energy. And he, the way he uses the card, he purposefully treats them very sloppily and throws them about and makes, uh, he doesn't make it look nice and flourishing on purpose. And it's all part of how he, about how he, how he behaves, but he's got a really humble energy to him. I just really like how he entertains and how like creative and clever he is with, with his work. So yeah, Leonard Green is definitely a good, uh, <laughs> recommendation for, yeah, creative stuff. Okay. Next question is favorite Pokemon. Okay, so when I was little, my favorite Pokemon was Dragonite because I really liked Dragonite and I liked like Lance and stuff. I thought it was a really cool character and he had Dragonite. I thought Dragonite was cool. I also liked Gengar and also Jigglypuff was like the first Pokemon I ever, ever saw. So I have this kind of inherent nostalgia for Jigglypuff. I can still kind of feel what Jigglypuff feel. It feels like, I don't know why, but Jigglypuff feels like the first time you ever ate a marshmallow or something like, you know, when you're a kid and you've never had a marshmallow before and then you get given a marshmallow and it's all soft and it's squishy. You've never had that texture or feel before. That's what Jigglypuff feels like as a vibe from like Pokemon, which is quite fitting really, isn't it? <laughs> so Jigglypuff. But my favorite Pokemon is probably going to be Ambipalm because I think he's really cute and he's kind of cheeky and kind of silly as well. He's kind of funny. I feel like if I was a Pokemon, I'd probably be an Ambipalm. Do you know what I mean? Like he's got, um, he, his tails are like hands basically and he can do stuff while he sort of lounges and uses his tails and stuff like that. So I really like his aesthetic and I think he's kind of cute. Like when, when I first saw all those generation of Pokemon, I thought they were all just really weird and silly. And when I first saw him, I did think he was really weird, but I've grown to appreciate him. You know what it's like? Like when you actually spend time with Pokemon, you grow to appreciate them. And, um, I used him a lot for battling and I really enjoyed spending time battling with him back in the day. Basically, um, so he has this special ability called technician 
and it powers up his weak moves. Any moves that do 40 damage or less, it powers them up. I don't know by how much, like it multiplies the damage of them. And so uh, what I had was he would have fake out and fake out is a weak move. It does 40 damage and fake out goes first and it makes the other po- uh, the other Pokemon flinch. So they can't attack. But because he had his technician, it powered it up. And I also gave him a silk scarf. And I just like the idea of actually giving him a silk scarf like he wears a silk scarf. And a silk scarf powers up normal type moves. And he's a normal type Pokemon. So all of that added together, his first move does a really, really large amount of damage. Like a stupid large amount of damage. And then he can use a move to get out of there and not be hit at all because he's really fast. So yeah, it was really fun back in the day to uh, like actually use him. So yeah, I'll be pumped. <laughs> Okay, next question is, what got you into mods and modding? Okay, well, um, it's not so much that I got into mods, but it's more like mods modding came out of what I do, I guess. Because first of all, right, so I make videos and I record the videos and I record the games and stuff. When when I'm making videos, so I actually do a lot of tweaking in the background. There's a lot of tweaking involved in actually setting up to record just just setting up to record there's a lot of tweaking to get that to even look nice and look right so the amount of tweaking that i put into it i started to put the tweaking into the game as well like i'll give myself uh, unlimited health or something like that like little cheats and stuff because when you're recording like you gotta when you're recording because i i could waste hours of my time getting an item or something or i could just give myself that item or hack a save file or something like that so it kind of started coming out of that that I needed the game to be immediately presentable for me instead of me having to spend time on some fiddly when I when I otherwise wouldn't want to. Um, and the other thing is, I've always, I've always never like taken things as they are. Like I don't like, I don't like to just be. I don't know what to say. Like I don't listen to what people tell me. I like to try and f- fiddle with it my, my own way and stuff. I feel like modding is. I'm getting to fiddle with it in my own way and I'm getting to put my own unique twists on it and stuff like that because I don't like anybody can anybody can watch anybody play a game and I'm not massively massively entertaining but I I don't do any visual editing in my videos really so I can't like mod that side of things so I like to add to the to the to the game beyond what its base set is. The other thing is I use Linux as my operating system because I don't like Windows and with Linux, you've got to do a lot yourself. Like there's a lot you've got to tell it to do and you've got to mod it yourself. But because of that, you get the freedom of it being under your control and basically it not doing things in the background that you don't want it to do. So I feel like that the modding aspect of a game comes out of just my inherent nature of wanting to uh, partake in the overall uh, uh, configuration of of a thing (laughs) so yeah it all just kind of goes hand in hand really (laughs) okay um next question if you had unlimited budget and resources to design and release your own game can be card game tabletop board game video game etc what would that game be that's a good question that's a very good question um so i well, so the fi- well, the thing is, I am constantly making and designing games anyway. I'm always, my, one of my favorite pastimes is to design and think about game design and stuff like that. I read a lot of RPG design books, game design books, and I'm always like wanting to, I'm thinking about making board games and card games and stuff like that. I absolutely do at some point want to design a, a fast paced card game because I feel that modern, uh, collect, modern collectible card games, they suffer from what's referred to as analysis paralysis, where you have a hand of cards and you're like, which one shall I play? How much energy do I spend to pay this card? And I do want to design a card game that's fast paced where two players can just, you know, duel it out or whatever quickly. <laughs> um, so I guess if I was to design a game, I would want it to be an RPG work with stats because I like that kind of thing. Uh, particularly me being poorly, I can't play fast paced games because they tire me out. Whereas an RPG, a turn based RPG, it waits for you to decide what to do, so there's no pressure to have to get it right necessarily, or do it there and then. I would design an RPG, but I also want it to be a randomly generated, roguelike procedurally generated thing with massive replayability because of that. 
so that you can always just try again because one of the most fun things is just restarting and playing it again that's just one of the most funnest things <laughs> So, so that would be the mechanical structure of the, the, whatever the game is. And then the other side of things, I would probably like to write a nice fantasy story to go with it because that's what I'm good at doing. So I'd like that as a game. But it's an interesting question because uh, it's about like if I had unlimited budget and resources and stuff like that. And obviously that would be really useful. But what I feel that would be most important to any game design honestly, regardless of the amount of budget and the resources, is the, like, the people that you trust to partake in that experience. Because yes, I could make a game on my own, but I feel like a game like that would be like 10 times better if I relied on certain types of friends who I know who would be uh, aidful to making it as a production as well so yeah i would absolutely have to ask other people if only i knew like a computer scientist or something oh my goodness <laughs> and yeah other people who we could work on ideas with and stuff like that that for me would be that would be the most fulfilling type of game for me something that i'd made with a group of people that we made it together yeah okay <laughs> next question say you never became sick like it just didn't ever happen where do you think you'd be currently what do you think you'd be doing do you think you would have ever started youtube how would your outlooks and philosophies differ from what they are currently okay okay interesting question okay well there's two ways to answer this question there's two ways to answer this question okay so the the primary answer to this question is the obvious answer to this question okay so the primary the primary answer to the question is okay so I started to get sick towards the end of university and towards the end of university. So we, we, uh, I was, I studied under a, 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 a novelist as my teacher and, uh, he really liked my writing and he basically said, Oh, I'd like to talk to you about your writing and maybe we should talk to my agent or whatever it was at the time. So to answer the question from, the most obvious perspective what 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 would be the case would be i'd probably be a very mildly <laughs> successful writer very mildly because i would have almost i would absolutely have pursued um with him basically i remember at the time actually he said i'd i want to talk to you about your work and i said i really appreciate that thank you that i mean that was a really big deal for him to say that to me i think there's only one other person in the class that he said that to I said, I really appreciate that, but I, I have to, I have to work on my health because my health is deteriorating. I had to work on the health and I started going to, uh, the hospital for, uh, it was for, um, it was like for extreme fatigue and extreme illnesses. It was like a hospital for sort of like chronic. It was a hospital for chronic illness. That's what it was. Yeah. So I started going to hospital at a time. So I said, I have to work on, on my health instead. And he said, uh, he said, that's, he said, fine. And he said, that offer still stands. So, so the point is, if I hadn't have, if I didn't, if I didn't need to have done the health thing, then yes, I would have pursued that. And I would be, like I say, mildly successful. And then, uh, I would, I mean, I'm from, I'm presuming that I would have pursued some kind of family scenario or something like that but at the very least i think i would be writing and i my main genre of writing is sort of like um children's fantasy sort of thing so i would be i'd be doing that basically so that's the that's the obvious answer to the question um but i don't think that's the true answer to the question because i so 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 that's not because that's that, that doesn't necessarily uh relate to my personal like beliefs and stuff so so the, the true answer to the question in my opinion is that how things happen couldn't happen any other way now i think that time goes outwards from the present okay because we're told that time goes forward like an arrow right but it actually goes outward from the present and because of that the past right is uh, actually just an invention of our current present scenario and we actually reflect and impose our current positions upon uh, our, our 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 thought-based past situations right so like you mentioned the butterfly effect yeah and the, what's what's a butterfly effect like a butterfly flaps its wings in brazil and then there's an avalanche in the himalayas or something like that right now that is true okay that is inherently true however that's only one side of the coin because what is also true is that when there's an avalanche in the Himalayas, a butterfly flaps its wings, right? But nobody ever tells you that bit, do they? 
They only ever say it from one to the other because they think time goes forth like an arrow, but it doesn't. Time goes outwards from now, right? So they're both inherently apply, uh, implying each other. So the true answer to the question is that, um, you know, nothing would have altered. As for how my, like, personal philosophies or outlook would differ, like, I think that I have always had that, like, inside me, basically, like, that's always been my sort of uh, inner personality. Um, I don't think that I learn things that I wouldn't have learned uh, if I had done other things. I think it's more that I cultivated aspects that I already kind of owned, basically, which is slightly different, I guess. I think it's the kind of thing where it comes out of the situation because it comes out of me more than it comes out of the situation because it comes out of the situation, right? Carl Sagan says, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And I think that's a very funny thing, but that's very, very true. If you definitely, if you try, if you think in your head of how you would change something in your life and you try and go back and try and figure out how you change it, If you genuinely try really, really hard to actually start changing it, you're going to go, okay, so suppose this didn't happen. Oh, no, well, therefore that didn't happen. And therefore, and you'll just go on and on. And honestly, if you do that, the whole universe will fall apart. You will literally unravel it like a cloth if you try and do that. It cannot happen any other way than it is because, because it, because it arises upwards. That's the thing. So yeah, I I mean, because I, I certainly wouldn't have. I don't believe I would have a YouTube channel and therefore I wouldn't have anyone to ask me this question. But because I'm, 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 I'm answering this question now, because this question answering now is arising out of the current now. (laughs) And then when you hear my answer to the question, my answer, my answer to the question is arising out of your current now because you're hearing me say it. (laughs) That's how it goes, right? Does that make sense? Anyway, let's move on to a different question. Okay. What is a skill or talent that you wish you had or want to learn? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think that, I mean, I can't really think of anything just like a brand. I can't really think of a brand new thing. Um, I, I think the best way to answer it would be to uh, just, I would like to level up all of my current skills and talents into the next uh, uh, level. So I'd still, I'm still going to be learning something new as part of that. So I play the piano, I play the keyboard piano. So I'd like to level that up. I'd like to learn some more songs on that. There's certain things I have. It's like, you hear it, you hear someone play piano and you're like, oh, I want to learn that. I want to, I want to be able to do that. So probably that, I probably want to level that up. Um, I'm not so fussed about leveling up my video ability because with more skill comes more application. And I'm not sure that I like need to spend the time on more video editing. So um, I think it's more just more like sort of like skill based hobbies and stuff like that. Um, I also very occasionally like to do like magic tricks and stuff and card tricks and stuff like that. I don't I haven't really done that for a long time, but I guess I, I do occasionally see some magic as well and be like, oh, let's have a go at that and see. <laughs> so yeah, probably that. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, maybe uh, as a tangent from that, there's a book, there's a book called Mnemonica. Mnemonica is a, a memorized card stack. It's a, the, the cards are stacked. And it's a memorized card stack that uses mnemonics to remember it. And so I guess that's probably a good answer to the question. Uh, that's a good new skill or talent to learn because um, I'm not very good with my hands anymore because of when I'm in pain. So I can't really do like flourishing tricks and stuff like that. But to do a memorized, basically a memorized deck and the usage of the memorized deck is quite useful because it can be cut and shuffled in certain ways to produce certain effects and know where certain cards are. And you can do some quite uh, stunning uh, revelations, but it's actually because it's just all memorized, but you wouldn't know that, would you? So yeah, I think that's a good answer. I'd like to, I'd like, I'd like to, yeah. <laughs> Next question. What is an odd or unique talent that you have that most people don't know about or can't do? How did you learn it and or find out you had it? And then he says, for example, I taught myself how to recite the alphabet backwards because I was bored one day and it became ingrained. (laughs) 
Okay, well, I'm going to need to see a YouTube short of that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's an odd, unique talent? Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> this is pretty odd. Yeah, you've asked for odd. This is pretty odd. Okay, so basically, yeah. I don't, know how, I don't even know how to describe this. <laughs> basically, I can, like, bend my ears. Okay, you know when you touch the top of your ear and it goes up like a like a bridge, like a humpy bridge like that? And it's it's stiff, isn't it? Right? Mine is not stiff. So basically, so basically what I can do is I can bend my ear backwards on itself so it goes up like an elf ear. I, co- I can make like elf ears because I'm secretly an elf or something. But I can also like fold it inside itself. <laughs> I can fold my ear inside itself, like roll it up basically. <laughs> Is that odd enough? Is that is that odd enough and unique enough? Um, basically, because I have really soft ears, and as like a relaxing thing for me, I like to sort of rub my ear because it's soft. It's just like a relaxing thing. So over time, I've obviously rubbed my ears away, <laughs> but but they're not. But that's going to make it sound like they're floppy or something. Like I've got Dumbo ears or something. It's not like that. It's not like that. I have perfectly ordinary ears. They're perfectly ordinary. But I can also do that on top, okay? So, yeah, that's that's my odd and unique talent. I hope you're happy with that. <laughs> Next question. How is your day going, smiley face? Oh, thanks. <laughs> my day is going good. Um, I had a bit of sickness earlier, but I got rid of that. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to go and record some more questions. <laughs> um. I'm recording all of these questions in batches because uh, I can't record. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to have the energy to record them all at once. So I'm just finding little pockets of time to record them. Um, and so I think that's quite enjoyable because I'm getting to spend time with each individual question answers questions individually. And I think that's quite fun as well. So, yeah, I guess that's how my day is going. But, yeah, thank you. My day is going well and I'm really enjoying answering these questions. And it's a really good way for me to, um, I guess, celebrate uh, a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel. And I'm really grateful for everyone partaking in that. And it makes me really happy. So, yeah, <laughs> gives me a big smile on my face, to be honest. Okay, next question. How did you come up with the name Ghosty Mallow? Okay. <laughs> so I'm I actually made my channel. I made I made Ghosty Mallow back in 2015 or so, and YouTube was very different back then. You know, it's changed a lot in the past years. Originally, I thought I wanted to do like a Lego unboxing channel or something. I looked at what channels there were on youtube at the time because youtube is different now so everyone's got really different names but back then i looked at what channels were quite popular and i I looked at it and basically the channels that were popular they sound like real names but fictional so i realized that because we've grown up in a society where we're given first name last name because we've grown up in that society the most popular channels realistically speaking have a channel name that leads into what we've been handed down we've given our own naming conventions right so i thought okay i need to make a name that's first name last name right (laughs) i was toying with the idea of toasty I thought toasty sounded cute. And then I thought of toasted, ma- I thought of toasted marshmallows. I guess I thought of toasted marshmallows. So I thought of toasty mallow was actually first, right? Toasty mallow was first, right? But I don't eat toast anymore. I used to eat a lot of toast in the evening because it was a good way to wind down on a, on a plain uh, meal because when I was sick, it's like a plain thing to have. But I don't really eat toast anymore. So I was kind of wind- winding off the idea of toast. And I also looked up toasty mallow as well at the time. I looked it up. And I found something that looked a little bit like Toast Mallow, some kind of blog or something where somebody was maybe called that or something. Anyway, I've always really liked cute ghosts. I've always really liked cute ghosts and cute little spooky things. And I like cute spooky. I don't like scary spooky things, but I like cute spooky things. And so it just made sense. Oh, ghosty instead of toasty. It just made much more sense. It just felt right. And then it to be like a cute little ghosty marshmallow thing. It just kind of makes sense. So that. (laughs) So yeah, I don't know. It just came came out as like a. It just feels like it just feels like a, a name. So yeah, that's my name. That's my name. <laughs> it's ghosty. Okay, and last question. Question number ten. What video of yours are you most proud of? Okay. <laughs> All right. Knowing knowing me, knowing what you know about me, what do you think my answer is going to be to this question? What do you think is my answer? <laughs> 
My most proud video is obviously my first video I ever made. My my first grandma episode, Wind Waker Randomizer with Grandma. So basically, I know a lot of people are embarrassed by the first video. And there's a lot of things that I look back at that first video. I do look back at that first video and I'm like, okay, that could have been better. Or this could be taken to be embarrassing in a certain context of it. But the entirety context of it being my first video and my first production, especially because of how sick I am and how hard I worked and how much I've improved since that video it's easy to look back at your first video and think oh my gosh I've improved so much look how crap my first video is but for me it works the opposite way because that was the genesis and I would not have been able to have been better at making videos now if it weren't for that one so I'm absolutely proud of that one and I always go back and like look at it and watch it every now and then just to just to be like you know <laughs> yeah I think that all of the pride of all of my channel stems from the wellspring of that particular video, doesn't it? So, yeah, that's the answer. (laughs) Okay, yeah, thank you. Those are some good questions. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your support on my channel. Okay. (laughs) All right, then. So, next up, we have White Tulip. So, thank you for support on my channel. And let's see what questions they have. Question number one is what was your favorite childhood console game and why or a top three if it's too hard to decide <laughs> well uh, obviously i already talked about my favorite games and i i i think that if i if i had to choose if i had to choose one of my favorite childhood console games it would be wind waker as i've already talked about just the inherent magic of that game is sort of unquestionable in its own way isn't it so there's that but i'll i'll, I'll mention three games so there's there's three games that that we would always just kind of play just all the time. We used to play a lot of Star Fox Adventures, which is very funny because Star Fox is basically a space shooter game, but they were developing a game about dinosaurs and it wasn't really working, so they decided to put Star Fox as a character in it, and it's just a really fun game. It's basically a Zelda game, but not a Zelda game, so we used to like playing that a lot. And the other two staples that we would just always play is like Mario Party and Mario Kart Double Dash. Both of those games are just like the kind of, you can just pick those up and just play those games, you know. We'd always play Mario Party and we'd always play Mario Kart Double Dash. Double Dash had the option to play every single course, so we'd do a every single track uh, session, which is always fun. And uh, Mario Party, we'd play, we usually did 10 turns of Mario Party. But I remember during the summer, my mum would say, let's do 60 turns. And then we'd stop after every 10 turns. And we'd do that, like, because the summer's like six weeks or something. So we'd do that once a week and then play the whole part. And it would last the whole summer. So that was always a really fun uh, uh, childhood uh, game thing, I suppose. (laughs) All right, next question. Three books you would like to read with your children? Okay, that's a good question. Um... Well, I think the the first one's going to have to be I Want My Hat Back. That's a pretty good book. If you haven't read I Want My Hat Back, that's a good children's book. That's a very good children's book. I like that. I think I would choose something by Diana Wynne-Jones. I want to choose Diana Wynne-Jones because she is she is the godmother of children's fantasy, right? She's an important writer in the role of children's fantasy. And she is the godmother of that in England as well, in English children's fantasy as well. She's written many, many books, some of which, like, some of some of them I don't even, like, enjoy necessarily. I didn't, didn't necessarily even enjoy them. But I do enjoy some of her books as well. Like, I think there's something for everyone. And also, how she writes her characters is quite realistic. Like, her characters can sometimes be kind of grumpy in a in a lovable and realistic kind of way. And I do think that's an important uh, and engaging way to process through the through a children's fantasy genre uh, and, and, to, and to read of somebody as well. So, yeah, that's that's cool. I choose her. <laughs> but my main choice would probably be uh, Terry Jones's Fairy Tales because uh, Terry Jones is a pretty special person anyway. And he wrote those fairy tales for his daughter. And I remember both my mum and my dad separately reading those to me. 
But then I also remember a couple of years later when I was older, reading them to myself as well. And so they are pretty a big deal for me. Uh, I mean, he's a pretty important figure in uh, British fantasy writing and, and comedy writing uh, as well. And so then to, to, how, to, to read those with my parents and then to read them with myself, I did find those very inspiring and they're very magical and they are brand new fairy tales as well. They're not just the same old fairy tales. So yeah, I would, uh, I think that's a specialist book I would choose. And final question, what is your dream job? Well, I suppose my dream job is a writer. I would, I would like to do writing. I would be a children's book author, uh, fantasy literature. That's kind of my, my, my sort of range and the kind of things I also like to read. I would do that. Uh, so yeah, just, just a, just a nice, just a nice average children's writer would be nice, I suppose. Um, if I could choose if I could do absolutely anything, I would also be interested to be like a director of a British anime company. I think that would be a pretty impressive thing. When I watch a lot of anime, it's always American dubbed voices. And for me, being British, it just doesn't, f it, sometimes it just doesn't feel right because they're American voices. I just, I just don't associate with that. And I know that a lot of Americans like British accents. I know there's a lot of range in a British accent. So I'd be very interested if I could if I could do anything, I would be the writer director in control of this uh, British anime company. And then we would basically uh, import uh, Japanese anime and overdub them in English and also make our own uh, British anime as well. I think that would be a pretty cool job to have on it and have a whole team of writers and, and artists and people in the company and make sure everybody's paid fairly and, and, and everyone's looked after. I think that'd be a really, really cool company. And I, and I would like to imagine that that British anime company would build up a reputation for all of those things and being good at what it does. So yeah, that. <laughs> okay, thank you for your questions. <laughs> All right, that's all we can fit in episode three. So we got one more episode of the Q&A to come. And we've got two previous episodes that you can absolutely watch. We probably already have anyway. But there we go. So thanks for listening. And I'll see you next time. Yes. <laughs>